I'm just about to fly out of Reagan National Airport in Washington, D.C. I've been at the Museum of the Bible for a Society of Bible Craftsmanship conference, and I shot there what I hope to be some of the most important videos I ever make. And there's a screaming kid over there, so I'm going to walk over here. I, of course, got to tour the museum, and it was quite an experience. I definitely recommend that everybody who loves the Bible and has the opportunity to go to Washington, D.C., definitely tour the Museum of the Bible. I'm actually not much of a museum guy myself. I tend to like to gather information through books and articles and podcasts, but there are some elements of the Bible's history that I think just have to be seen to be really appreciated. In fact, what really strikes you, or at least it struck me, as through the Museum of the Bible, I looked back beyond the invention of printing into the medieval and even into the ancient world, is that each individual copy of scripture, or often just portion of scripture, was a physical artifact, not identical to anything else in the whole world or in the whole history of the world. It's amazing what ancient scribes could do, both in Hebrew and Greek, the beauty and the consistency with the materials they were using. It was just so amazing. But only computers and printers are capable of producing identical Bibles. It is so helpful then to see the papyrus with my own eyes, to see the scratches of ink on there, to see the parchment with my own eyes. And though there are many other things in the museum that I'd like to talk about, and I hope to do so in another video, there's really one that's on my heart, and I just have to tell you about it before I leave Washington, D.C., which is actually sort of the city of my birth. I was born in nearby Alexandria. Coming to the National Mall, Washington Monument, Capitol Building feels like going home, even though I now live in the other Washington. I want to talk about one special room that'll actually appear in the backdrop of the big videos that are going to come out on my channel in a couple weeks. I'm trying to find a place to rest this camera. It's so heavy. Here we go. There was a room that tried to tabulate in the Museum of the Bible exactly, exactly how many languages in the world have Bible translations. There are dozens, hundreds, of course, and that's a wonderful thing. Most of the world's population is by now covered in at least one of the languages that they speak. We're not used to this in America. We are all pretty much monolingual unless we've come from other countries ourselves. But around the world, there are often indigenous languages, tribal languages, and then languages of wider communication, they're called. So in colonial places, you know, India wasn't exactly colonized, but it's sort of similar. It was run by the British for quite some time. English has actually served as a lingua franca, that it's united this people that speaks a very large number of individual languages, very large number. But as you look through the room at the Museum of the Bible, you see that there are many languages, whole people groups that have only the New Testament. They catalog this there. And then it's heartbreaking to see that there are many, many languages representing 80,000 speakers here, 270,000 speakers there, 18 million speakers there, whole language groups that have nothing. And in that spot is a clear piece of plastic in the shape of a book meant to indicate that this whole group of people needs God's word still. I just stood in that room in the Museum of the Bible and I looked around as I know many other people have done because my friends have come to the Museum of the Bible and told me about it. I looked around at all these languages, all these clear plastic books, and I thought about people for whom my world is not even a thought. I just thought about how ridiculous and arrogant it is for any one of the speakers of a language that already has the entire Bible to say, our language is God's special chosen language. In fact, our translation of the Bible is the perfect one. Nobody else gets one. You enter that room, you look around, and that person is going to say, actually, none of these really matter except for that one. All of them are corrupted or in error in some way, except for this one, which happens to be written in the language that I speak. No, God is not a respecter of nations or of languages. I've always thought this point was so profound, the very fact that God revealed himself in three very historic languages, that is, languages spoken by actual people. They weren't special Holy Spirit or angelic languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. The very fact that he did this, that he chose to reveal the Bible this way, 
reveals something about his refusal to choose one language as the special one, the one language that can really communicate his truth. No, God is able, and he proved it in the Bible, to speak every language and dialect in the Bible, see it in Acts 2, and to get his truth across in any language. There are no people in the entire world who speak the three biblical languages, the two major ones and one minor one, Hebrew and Greek being the main ones, Aramaic being the minor one that appears just a couple of places in Daniel and Ezra, uh, and a couple you know, individual places in the Gospels where it gets translated into Greek. There are no people in the world who can speak all three of those languages as native speakers. In fact, I doubt that there have been very many people in the whole history of the world who could speak all three of those languages as native speakers. I strongly suspect there's not a single person because I think though the, you know, there were people in the Jewish nation Israel who at the time of the New Testament had command of biblical Hebrew, but as I understand it, that language was really not spoken by the populace anymore. I'm still trying to understand some of the history here, but perhaps some of those folks who used biblical Hebrew as a liturgical language could also speak Koine Greek, maybe Aramaic too. That's the closest anyone has come, but that means that all the people in the world, practically in the history of the world, who've encountered God word, God's word have to encounter it in translation. This is the way God made the world. He could have done it differently. You have to encounter God's word in translation. You know, in Islam, I've talked about this, they think, uh, Arabic is the only real word of Allah. You have to read the Quran in Arabic or you're not really reading it. But that's not the Christian position. As I've said so many times on this channel, I repeat myself a lot. I'm so sorry. I just find that some truths have to be repeated before they get to people. This fact alone means that no one language is the special blessed language of God. Not Hebrew, not Greek, not Aramaic, not Arabic, not Latin, not is one of my favorite languages to talk about. I wish, knew, I wish I knew more about it. Hopefully I will in time to come, and I actually got to see a is Bible at the Museum of the Bible. That was really, really cool. And certainly not English. English is not the special chosen language of God. It is a problem that so many Americans are monolingual. That is, it makes it difficult for them to even think about what a translation is. Even those who've taken Spanish commonly tell me they don't remember a single word of it from their high school Spanish classes. So how could they possibly really know in a tactile way what translation is like? What kinds of difficult, terrible trade-offs it requires, no matter what languages you're translating? But there's another problem that maybe you've not thought about that comes from monolingualism, especially in a culture which you could call hegemonic, which rules the world, like the U.S. You really don't even have to think in our culture about accommodating people who speak other languages. Hardly any of the time do most American Christians have to think about this. If you live in a large city, maybe you do when you go shopping or something, but you can live, we can live our whole lives, not just ignorant of any given language of the world, of the 7,000 languages of the world, of which ours is just one, but we have the privilege and actually, you know, it's a gift of God. Our wealth is a gift from God that I'm grateful for. We can actually live in ignorance of the existence and therefore the claims on our conscience of other language groups, whole groups of people, again, thousands or millions. We're not forced to confront how chauvinistic it is, how narrow-minded it is to think that God chose the people who spoke our language. We get the perfect Bible and nobody else does. If you were a Christian family in New York City, let's say, and there's a refugee crisis in, in order to obey the commands of the Bible, to welcome the stranger, to serve those who can't serve you back. You end up taking in for six months a Syrian refugee family. Let's just imagine this. The dad speaks a little bit of English, the kids can mumble phrases, and the mom knows nothing because she's been home caring for the baby. In the first couple days, you're motioning at things and smiling at one another and nodding awkwardly. You're using gestures. You can kind of get across the basics. You know, here's your room, here's the bathroom, here's what you're going to eat this morning. You shove it in front of them. But then frustration sets in. You can't communicate. And you watch their faces, and you watch their frustration, and you feel your own frustration. You just know these poor folks have a very hard road ahead of them. And actually, this poor mom, even if the husband manages to get a job as an Uber driver like mine that brought me here, he's from Afghanistan. His wife has had a hard time learning English because she's been at home caring for the baby. 
Can you, in your mind's eye, look in the eyes of this refugee family that you've been serving for six months and say to them, you know, if you really want to know God's word, you're going to have to learn my language. God doesn't speak yours, or your Bible's imperfect and corrupt. I don't, on this channel, often get into righteous anger mode. I don't let myself. But the idea that the functionally illiterate people I served as a pastor for five years just need to buck up and learn Elizabethan English, that gets me righteously angry. And this is another people talking as if you have to learn the language of that one Bible in this whole massive room at the Museum of the Bible. You know, this is not the mainstream view of the King James Only Movement, but it is very commonly represented in my YouTube comments. I don't know how representative those comments are of the whole King James Only world. I'm taking, trying to take that world at its best. But even my brothers out there who are King James Only, who are in the mainstream of the King James Only movement, I would just say to you, please push back against this idea. It really is harmful. The world needs the Bible. Those empty slots in that amazing room, in the center of the Museum of the Bible, they need to be filled. God promised Abraham that he would send the seed of the woman. He promised first that seed to Adam and Eve. He promised to Abraham in Genesis 12 that he would send that seed of the woman not just to crush the head of the serpent, though he did, of course, thankfully, but to bless all the families of the earth. I love that passage. He told the Israelites in Exodus 19 that they were supposed to be a kingdom of priests mediating his presence to the nations. We Christians were actually told to go into all the world, not just to be stable in one land, but to actually seek out the lost. We have to have. We have to have theologically sound ideas about the way language is supposed to operate in God's world and in the practice, especially, of Bible translation. If you are looking for a place to send your charitable dollars, your, message, your, your missions giving, you could do little better than find a missionary with Bibles International like my friend Troy Manning or find some fund they have there for something and just give to it. I don't spend on this channel a whole lot of time talking about the need for world Bible translation. Maybe I will in the future, I don't know. I'm trying to solve problems here at home first. But I really think that one of the ways that we can solve the problems that we have in English-speaking lands, all of our battles about which Bible translation is best, is to send every Christian to the Museum of the Bible and make them sit in that room, turn all the way around, and look at, and even just try to start counting the sheer number of whole groups of people who live their whole lives in whatever language it is, not even thinking about English, not even maybe being aware that it exists, thinking about them and their needs. Think about God's promise to bless every family of the earth. Think about the nations that will show up in the New Jerusalem, in the eschaton, in the last days, in the millennial kingdom. What a good lesson for us all. I'm going to hop on the plane and not too long, and I'm going to head back to the other Washington. I really enjoyed my time in Washington, D.C. I'd love to come back. I'm going to try to bring my family to the Museum of the Bible. I'm incredibly excited about the two big videos I'm actually going to release on the same day, an hour apart. I'm hoping to do some publicity for these videos. This is going to be really big. This is actually going to take some real work after doing some real work shooting inside the Museum of the Bible with some real help from folks. I'll explain that later. You'll see these videos. I'm really excited about them. Catch you next time, Bible Nerds.